Chapter 2, Section 5, Continuity. So, uh, the limit of a function as x approaches to a can often be found simply by calculating the value of the function at a. Functions with this property are called continuous at a. So here is our formal definition. A function f is continuous at a number a if the limit as x approaches to a of f of x equals to f of a. Okay, so there's our formal definition, and we can have a nice, pretty picture to go along with that. All right, so here in this case, the blue one is our function f of x, and we're considering what happens in the neighborhood around a. So um, if the limit as x approaches to a, remember that means we are looking at where the output is heading as the input values are getting closer and closer and closer to a from either side. So as the input values are approaching a from either direction, they're squeezing in from either direction, the outputs of the function are heading toward f of a, then we'd, uh, then we'd say that the, func the function is continuous at a. So in this statement, the limit as x approaches to a of f of x equals to f of a, there are three main components. One, that the limit as x approaches to a of f of x has to exist. Two, that the function is defined at x equals to a. And three, that they both equal each other. Right? So all three pieces must be true in order for a function to be continuous at x equals to a. Right? Again, looking back at our picture, Based on here, we get, to, uh, we get to conclude that f of a is a valid result, that it exists. We can input a into our function. We'll get some sort of valid output. That the limit exists as x approaches to a. We can see that the output values are approaching this result right there. And finally, that they equal each other. The limit as x approaches to a um, of f of x equals to f of a. Okay, so all three of these pieces must be true. When we have a nice graph like this, it's really easy to spot. I think you'll find that in this section, the graph is really easy to spot when a function is continuous and when it's not. But when we're working with an equation, it might be a little bit more difficult. And when, and when we're asked to solve, and when we're asked to prove that a function is continuous, then these are the three steps we'd have to take. Uh, to show that a function is continuous at the value uh, x equals to a, we'd have to show that f of a is defined, that it exists, that a is in the domain of the function f. We'd have to show that the limit as x approaches to a of f of x exists. And finally, that these two things are equal to each other, that they, that, that, that they equal each other. And that's what can um, uh, come together to show that the function is continuous at x equals to a. So, if f is defined near a, in other words, f is defined on an open interval containing a, except perhaps at a, we'd say that f is discontinuous at a if f is not continuous at a, or has a discontinuity at a if f is not continuous at a. Okay. Uh, physical phenomena are usually continuous. For instance, uh, the displacement of velocity of a vehicle varies continuously with time. So really anything involving time is, is, uh, is going to result in continuous functions. Um, person's height, uh, so if you think of like their height from you know, being a baby up to an adulthood, right? there's a smooth continuous graph displaying their height. You can't go from being four foot, you know, four foot five at one point in your life to being four foot ten without those middle values. You can't skip anything, right? You grow continuously. Um, but discontinuities uh, do occur uh, in such um, fields, such as electrical currents. So any future uh, electrical engineers are going to deal a lot with. Uh, uh, graphs that have discontinuities. So geometrically, we can think of functions uh, that are continuous at every number on an interval as a function whose graph has no breaks in it. The graph can be drawn without removing your pen from your pe uh, from your paper. Okay. So for example, 
So if we have some interval from a is continuous in this uh, segment, if it's true that when we graph it, we can just graph it without ever having lifted our pencil. So I can, for example, graph something like this, right? So I, I, I could draw it without ever lifting my pencil. Or maybe something like that. Again, I can draw without ever having lifted my pencil. Okay, so intuitively, it's pretty easy to deal with continuity if we just have a picture, right? You can just look at it and go, yep, looks continuous. Uh, it's easy to spot. It's a little harder uh, when we deal with equations. We'll see some examples. Uh, but first, let's look at this other graphical example. Okay, uh, which number is, at which number is f discontinuous and why? Okay, so here f of x is this blue function. Everything blue is the f of x function. Uh, and that includes the little dots, right? So that little dot right there is indicating that when we evaluate the function at x equals to 5, the output is this dot, whatever, whatever height that is, right? It doesn't matter what it is. Okay, so um, the places where we have discontinuities easy to spot. There's one right here, right? There's a little hole. So um, f is discontinuous at x equals to 1. And the reason is that, well, the function is not defined there. f of 1 is does not exist, right? It's undefined when x equals to 1. Okay. Uh, let's look at the next place where we have a discontinuity. It's discontinuous at x equals to 3, right? And the reason it's discontinuous at x equals to 3 um, is because uh, the limit doesn't exist. We have that the left limit, the limit as x approaches to 3 from the left-hand side exists. Yep, it's heading toward there. And the limit as x approaches to 3 from the right-hand side does exist. Yep, it's heading toward that output over there, whatever that is. But clearly, they don't equal each other. Therefore, the limit as x approaches to 3 does not exist. Okay, and actually, let me go back to this previous one and point out that uh, for x equals to 1, the function is not defined at 1. That's why there was a discontinuity. But note that for this case, the limit did exist. As x approaches to 1 from either side, the outputs of the function were heading toward the same value, whatever, whatever that was. So the limit as x approaches to 1 of f of x did equal to some value l. It was, it, it was valid, so let's say that this is capital L. Let's call that capital L sub 1. So the limit did exist. It was fine. I don't know what number that is, but I could see from the picture that it did exist. But there was a hole there, so that means that the function uh, was not defined at x equals to 1. That's why there was a discontinuity at x equals to 1. On the other hand, when we analyze uh, the case for x equals to 3, the function is defined at x equals to 3, right? That's why there's a solid dark circle there. That means that f of 3 is equal to this dark circle, so it was valid. Um, it was defined. So that one was fine. It's defined. However, the limit doesn't exist. The left limit uh, does exist. The right limit does exist. But they equal to different values. Therefore, the limit did not exist. And that's what the problem was. That's why there's a discontinuity at x equals to 3. And finally, when we look at uh, x equals to 5, again, we have a case where the limit does exist. And the function is defined at f equals to uh, 5. That's why we have this dark circle here. It means it is defined there. However, they don't equal each other. So that's why there's a discontinuity there. Okay, so at x equals to 5, the limit does exist. So the limit as x approaches to 5 of f of x is defined. That's fine. The function is defined at x equals to 5. We can see that there is a valid result. That's why we have a little hole there. I'm sorry, a little dot there. This is defined. 
unlike the case of x equals to 1, there was just a little hole there. So that one was just not defined anywhere. However, they don't equal each other. So because they don't equal each other, that's why we have a, dis uh, a discontinuity. Discontinuous at x equals to 5. Okay, so three different types of discontinuities, uh, but all discontinuous for different reasons, but they're all discontinuous. Okay, where is this function discontinuous? f of x equals to x squared minus x minus 2 all over x minus 2. Note that in order for it to be continuous, we need the function to be defined at that value. Uh, we need the limit to exist. Uh, and we, we need them to equal to each other for all the points where it's continuous. So if we can find places where that's not going to happen, that's the places where they'll be discontinuous. So in particular, note that if x equals to 2, we will have something divided by 0. So note. When x equals to 2, we put a 2 there, put a 2 there, put a 2 there, put a 2 there. We end up with 4 minus 4. 4 minus 4 over 0, which then gives you a 0 over 0. Uh, what we can just conclude from here is that f of 2 is undefined. f of 2 is undefined. Right? Or does not exist. So from that I can conclude that this function f of x is going to have a discontinuity at x equals to 2. f of x is discontinuous at x equals to 2. Later on we'll see that um, this function will be continuous everywhere else, but for now it's enough to point out that this is a spot where it is discontinuous. Right? Look for the places where you're going to have uh, a fraction where the denominator is a 0, That'll let you find the places where the function is discontinuous. Okay, let's look at its graph. Graph. Uh, so if we just uh, graph this function, this is what we're going to get. And just from the graph, we can also easily spot that there's a little hole there. The function is undefined at x equals to 2. There's a little hole. That's why this function is discontinuous at x equals to 2 or has the discontinuity at x equals to 2. Okay, what about this one? Where is this function discontinuous? Note that in this case, um, if, we, if we plugged in a 0, f of blank equals to 1 over blank squared, if we plugged in a 0, we would be dividing by 0, so that might cause you to think that we have a problem, but we don't because in fact this is letting us know that this rule is to be followed for all numbers in the domain except this one at x equals to 0. When we have x equals to 0, the output should be 1, right? So f of 0 for this function is defined. It's f of 0 equals to 1, right? So this isn't really valid. You're not supposed to follow these set of instructions for x equals to 0. You follow them for everything else. Okay, um, so part of it is there. The, the function is defined uh, at x equals to 0. Um, but notice that the limit does not exist as x approaches to 0. The limit as x approaches to 0 of 1 over x squared is going to be equal to positive infinity, right? Think about it, um, you know, if we start inputting values that are really, really small, the smallest, tiniest little decimals, positive or negative, we square them, we're going to get an even bigger, tiny, tiny little positive decimal. And then we know that the relationship with a fraction, 1 over a very, very small number equals a big number. Right? So 1 over a very, very small, tiny, teeny little decimal is going to be equal to a very big number. 
The smaller that goes, the bigger that goes. The smaller, tinier, teenier that goes, the bigger and bigger that goes. So as we let the input values get smaller and smaller, infinitely close to zero, really, really, really small, the, this relationship would mean that the outputs get infinitely large. Now, because we're squaring, it doesn't matter whether you're inputting a positive or a negative number, the output is gonna be positive from here. Therefore, the whole thing is heading toward positive infinity. So it is tempting to think that we found the answer, the answer is infinity, but remember that that's not, uh, that does not mean that the, the, that the limit exists. This means that the limit does not exist. It just happens to not exist in a particular way. It doesn't exist in the way in which it goes off toward positive infinity. But the answer to this is still the limit as x approaches to zero of one over x squared is, does not exist. And so this is what the graph would look like. We see that as x approaches to zero from either direction, the output values are just gonna get larger and larger and larger and larger and larger and larger and larger. So we know that it's heading toward positive infinity from either direction. However, the function is defined at uh, f of zero, it equals to one. So, um, the problem here, the reason why the, the function is discontinuous at x equals to zero is because the limit does not exist. In other words, the limit as x approaches to zero of f of x does not exist. Okay, so now let's take a look at this one. Where is this function discontinuous? So uh, this is back to the first function we had uh, before, and we saw that the function was not defined um, for x equals to 2, right? If we put a 2 here, we get a 0. So, okay, we can fix it. We can just put a new value for x equals to 2. So that takes care of that part of it. Um, but does that mean that we fixed it to a point where it's now continuous? Let's figure this out. So now we have that f of uh, 2 equals to 1. f of 2 equals to 1. Good. And if we can show that the limit as x approaches to 2 of f of x, if we can show this was 1, then we'd be able to conclude that there isn't a problem at 2. We'd be able to conclude that this function is continuous at 2. And later we could, we're going to show that it's continuous everywhere else. The only real problem potentially is down here when the denominator equals to zero. So that would be a wish list, right? So I don't know if this is true or not, right? So that's what we're gonna figure out right here. So let's figure out this limit. How do we figure that out? The limit as x approaches to two of x squared minus x minus two divided by x minus two well, we already figured out that if we let x equal to 2, this whole thing is going to end up with a 0 over 0. So we have to do other things. Uh, one of the tr tricks we learn is that we can factor things. So this is equal to the limit as x approaches to 2 of x minus 2 x plus 1 all over x minus 2. We FOIL this out, we get x squared plus x minus 2x, that gives me that minus x, minus 2. Good, so that's how this factors. And we know from before that we are allowed to cancel these out then, which then gives us the limit as x approaches to 2 of just x plus 1. And now we know that if we can, uh, since this is just a polynomial, and this is just a nice, pretty little polynomial. So we know we can just evaluate it, right? For polynomials, when you're trying to find the limit, you can just evaluate it. So this is going to be equal to blank plus 1. So this will just be a 2 plus 1, which gives me 3. Okay, so the limit, the limit does exist, but unfortunately it's heading toward 3. And we have that the function is defined... Uh, at x equals to 2, it's defined to be 1, so it's not going to match. So we're still going to have a discontinuity. Okay, so the limit exists at equals to 3. 
the function is defined at 2, it's equal to 1, but they don't match. So the limit as x approaches to 2 of f of x compared to f of 2, they're just not going to be equal to each other. This side, this side over here is heading toward 1. Oh, sorry. This side is heading toward 3, the limit is 3, and this was defined to be 1. So therefore, the function is going to have a discontinuity at x equals to 2. It would have been an easy fix, right? Obviously, if we just uh, define this function to say that this is a 3 right here, then the function would be continuous, which sounds like a really nice uh, homework question, right? What, like maybe like a, a little box here and put a question mark. Find the value such that uh, this function can be continuous when x equals to 2, right? And so after all this work, we see that the answer should have been 3. So that makes like a, that seems like a nice question. Let's take a look at the graph. So you see how this is the graph of this, x squared minus x minus 2. That gives us this graph right here. And it's got a little hole right there. And now we know that that little hole is heading toward 3. So we know that this is 3. Right? Because we found out that the limit of this function as x approaches to 2, we found out that the limit was 3. The limit as x approaches to 2 of x squared minus x minus 2 divided by because we found because we found out that this was true, that's how I know that this approaches to 3. As the input values approach 2 from either side, two, 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 as the input values approach 2, the limit is approaching 3. It's heading toward 3. And then there's a hole at 3 there, but the graph, what, uh, the function was defined this way. Let, uh, let the function equal to 1 when x equals to 2. Okay, but unfortunately, that's still a discontinuity. So this function is discontinuous at x equals to 2. Okay, let's take a look at one more. Let's remember the greatest integer function, f of x equals 2. And then it was a bracket, bracket with an extra slash through there and an extra slash through there. Remember what this does is it automatically rounds down, always rounds down to the nearest integer. So to refresh your memory, this means that, for example, say I had 5.4, 5.4, the answer after you apply it into this function would just be 5, and it rounds it down. But if I had 5.9, 5.9, the answer would still be 5, right? So it's not like rounding where you go to the nearest whole number. Uh, you always round down when it comes to this greatest integer function, okay? So no matter how close you are to 6, as long as you're below 6, then you go all the way down to the nearest whole number, in this case, a5, okay? That's how it works. Let's take a look at its graph then. The graph of the greatest uh, integer function looks like this. So for instance, if the input value is um, 3.7, uh, here's 3.7, its output is just going to be the number 3. If the input value is 3.1, its output value is going to be 3. If the input value is just 3, x equals to 3, it's going to still head to 3. So 3 leads to 3, 3.1 leads to 3, 3.7 leads to 3, pi is somewhere in here, pi, pi leads to, leads to 3. So all those values lead to 3, but as soon as we go over to the other side, like let's say we have 
2.99 right there. Okay, that leads you down here to 2. Okay, so that's the greatest integer function. And so uh, based on the picture and our understanding of continuity, hopefully now it's clear that the greatest integer function is going to have uh, a discontinuity at all the integer values. So f of x is going to be discontinuous at all integer values because the limit doesn't exist at any of those values. So the limit as x approaches to n of f of x does not exist for n equal to any integer. On the other hand, if uh, we stay away from those, if we just look at anything other than the integers, we see that everything works out well. So the, the function is continuous for all other values except for the integer values. Okay, so here's all the uh, four graphs of the four examples we just looked at. Um, and so by the graph, hopefully it's easy to spot that they're all discontinuous uh, in at least one point. Uh, and we can just follow the simpler rule when we're graphing that a continuous function is, uh, is going to have a graph that can be drawn without ever lifting your pen. Right? So we could see that we'd have a problem with that if we're trying to graph this one because there's a hole there. I can't graph it without lifting my pen. And then we'd have a problem here because this goes off toward infinity. So again, I'd have to lift my pen to come back over here and draw this part. And then, of course, the dot. Same thing with this one. I'd have to lift my pen to go over that little hole and draw the rest and then come back and draw that dot. So again, I'd have to lift my pen. Um, and then this one, obviously, I'd have to constantly lift my pen to draw these graphs. Okay, so these are all discontinuous. They're all discontinuous functions, but some of them have a special type of name for the type of discontinuity that they have. So this one, I think, is easy to spot. It's, it's discontinuous, but it's discontinuous for the reason that the limit is heading off to infinity. So we call these infinite discontinuities. This one, as you can see, um, has these little jumps. Uh, so jump discontinuity or step discontinuity. And then these two um, are very close to being continuous. There's just a little hole Sometimes the function is defined someplace else, or sometimes there's just a little hole. Either way, it would be easy to come in and fix this, right? These are fixable because I could just define a function, a, a, a special value to be equal to that value, right? To like fill in the hole. I could define my a new function that is very similar to this one, but uh, has an extra value at x equals to two in this case. Fill in the hole therefore fix it. So these kinds of discontinuities are called removable. Okay, so removable discontinuities are fixable, have an easy fix if we come back and redefine a new function uh, that, that has the appropriate relationship established to make sure that the holes are paved in. Right, so this one almost fixed it. As we saw, if we had only put a 3 there instead of a 1, we, we would have a continuous function. So a function can be continuous from the right at a number a if the limit as x approaches to a from the right side of f of x equals to f of a. And likewise, a function f is continuous from the left at a if the limit as x approaches to a from the left of f of x equals to f of a. Let's consider the greatest integer function once again. For example, let's say we consider the values at around x equals to 2. So say right here, at x equals to 2. If we focus on just the limit from the right-hand side, so say an x value is chosen there, and then there, and then there, and then there, and then there. So we're approaching x, but definitely from the right-hand side. 
then its output values are going to be there and there and there. And so they will all be approaching the value 2. And the value of the function at 2 is equal to 2. So we could say that the limit as x approaches to 2 from the right-hand side of the stepwise function, or the greatest integer function, is equal to 2. So it's continuous from the right at 2. In fact, if we did the same thing for 3, it would be continuous from the right. If we did it for, uh, for 4, for 5, for any whole number, as long as we're approaching the number from the right-hand side, we are going to get um, a continuous result. So, in general, we can conclude that So f of x equals to the greatest integer function is continuous from the right at x equals to capital N, where capital N is any integer. Or we could say that the limit, or I'd say because the limit as x approaches to capital N from the right-hand side, The limit as x approaches to n from the right-hand side of f of x equals to f of capital N for any integer value. So we can conclude that the function, the greatest integer function, is going to be continuous from the right-hand side uh, for any integer value. On the other hand, if we approach any integer value from the left-hand side, notice what happens. Let's again take, uh, let's take uh, uh, 3 for example. Here is x and then I'm approaching 3. All my input values are going to get closer and closer and closer to 3, but always approaching it from the left hand side. So 2.8, 2.85, 2.9, 2.99. The greatest integer function is going to give me an output of 2 every single time. So it seems like the outputs are always 2. The limit from the left-hand side is going to be approaching 2. However, the function at x equals to 3 equals 2, 3. So we're going to have a discontinuity from the left-hand side. So note, the limit as x approaches to 3 from the left-hand side of the greatest integer function is still equal to 2, but f of 3 equals to 3. So the limit as x approaches to 3 from the left-hand side equals to 2, but the value of the function at 3 equals to 3, they don't match. Right? So um, the function is always going to have, it's going to be discontinuous from the left-hand side. So f of x equal to the greatest integer function is discontinuous from the left side of any integer value because, because the limit as x approaches to n from the left-hand side of, this, uh, of the greatest integer function is going to be equal to n minus 1. Right? Just like we saw in this example, the limit as x approaches to 3 from the left-hand side, the result, the limit, headed toward 2, 1 less than that which is not equal to f of n. Uh, it's equal to n minus 1, not n. Uh, so the left side limits are not going to exist. OK, just to make sure that this notation is clear, let's do one more written example and the one that most often appears, uh, which is things around 1. So um, if we approach 1, but we approach it from the right-hand side, so we choose a value there, and then we choose a value there, and then there, and then there, and we approach 1, but always from the right-hand side. We see that the output values are going to approach 1. They match. As x approaches 1, the output values approach 1. That's like this. The limit as x approaches 1 from the right-hand side of the function will equal to f of 1.
right? If we evaluate the function at one, we have a dark circle there, which equals to one, so they all match. So let me write that one down. On the other hand, if we approach one from the left-hand side, so as x approaches to one from the left-hand side, we choose a value there, and then there, and then there, and then there, and then there. So we're making our way toward one, but from the left-hand side, the outputs of the greatest integer function are always gonna be zero, right? So the types of numbers we plug in are gonna be, say, for example, 0 0.5. And then as we get closer and closer and closer, we might plug in 0 0.99, for example, like right there. And remember that the greatest integer function rounds down, always down to the nearest whole number, which in this case would be zero. So the outputs would all be zero. However, if we evaluate the function at one, the answer is one. So we'd have this, the limit as x approaches to one, but from the left-hand side of f of x does exist and it equals to zero. But that means that this one doesn't match that one. It's not the same, it's one smaller than that one. Right, this, that's what this means here, this notation of one less, it's equal to one minus one. Right, which is this, the n is a one. So here, n was one in this little situation, so that's why there's a little one here. n equals to one, and that's where this comes in, n minus one. Okay, so the limit as x approaches one from the left-hand side equals zero. It doesn't equal one. Good. So that's why the function is not continuous from the left-hand side at x approaches to one. All right, let's do one more example. All right, let's consider the limit as x approaches to three of the absolute value of x minus three divided by x minus three. Obviously, we know that if we uh, evaluate this at three, so I'll put a note, that if we have blank minus three, minus three, and then uh, this, this, <clears throat> and we insert a three, then obviously this is gonna be equal to zero over zero is indeterminate, so uh, more information is needed, right? So we need to figure out what this is. Uh, we know that if we don't know what else to do, we can just go to our calculator, put this in a function, start plugging in decimal values that are really, really close to three from either side, and see what pattern emerges. That's one way to do this. The other way is to break this down into pieces, right? You have to think about when does it matter? When does the absolute value matter? It matters when whatever is inside there is negative. When whatever is inside there is positive, the absolute value makes no difference at all. So we can break it down this way. The limit as x approaches to three from the right-hand side, so always a little bit bigger than three, of the absolute value. Okay, so if we are only choosing values that are a little bit bigger than three, always a little bit bigger than three, then a little bit bigger than three minus three is always going to be a positive number. So for x being always strictly big, bigger than three, always larger than three, then x minus three is always going to be a little bit bigger than zero, always positive, because I'm just considering cases that are a little bit bigger than three. So for that reason, I get to just ignore that absolute uh, value and rewrite it this way, it is equivalent to the limit as x approaches to three from the right-hand side of just the x minus three all over the x minus three, which then cancels And so we end up with just one, positive one. Okay. On the other hand, from the other direction, the limit as x approaches to three from the left-hand side 
Okay, so now in this case, we are only considering input values to this function that are really close to three, but from the left-hand side, always a little bit smaller. Think 2.999. If we replace the x with a 2.999 and then subtract a three, we're gonna get a very, very small negative number, always negative. So for cases where x is definitely less than three, then I know for sure that x minus three is definitely going to be less than zero. It's definitely gonna be a negative, right? So I know that this is negative inside here, but I know that the absolute value is going to make everything positive. In order to make it positive, this is when we have to introduce a new uh, factor of negative one. So this is equivalent to saying the limit as x approaches to three from the left-hand side of x minus three, right? So I know for these special values of x, I know this is always going to be negative, always negative, because x is always gonna be something a little less than three. So we gotta come in here and go, well, let's make it positive. So we have to introduce an extra multiple of negative one. That's how these two products, when we multiply this whole thing, I'm guaranteed it's positive. And that was the, the intended outcome of an absolute value. It makes everything positive. That's why we have to introduce that. I know that can be really confusing. Uh, so just think your way through it. Okay, and then the denominator stays the same. Okay, now these guys can cancel and I'm left with just negative one. So the limit as x approaches to three from the right-hand side is gonna be one. The limit as x approaches to three from the left-hand side is going to be negative one. They don't match, so obviously the limit doesn't exist. The limit as x approaches to three, unrestricted limit, no conditions there, of our function does not exist. Okay, but People are then tempted to think, well, maybe the one-sided limits exist. Um, uh, excuse me, the one-sided limits do exist, so maybe people are thinking that the function could be continuous from one direction. It can't be continuous at three. We, uh, we can see that because the limit doesn't exist, right? In order for uh, a function to be continuous at uh, a number, the limit has to exist, the function has to be defined in that value, and they have to be equal to each other. And well, this fails even on that front. So obviously our function is not continuous at three. So this function has a discontinuity at x equals to three. Um, okay, so that part should be fine. But then is there a one-sided continuity? Um, as x approaches to three from the right-hand side, the limit exists, it equals to one and as it approaches from the left-hand side. So there's a temptation to say that it's a one-sided continuity, but in this case, that's not going to be true because we know that the function does not exist uh, when we try and evaluate at uh, x equals to three. So note that f of three is equal to So the function does not exist there. So um, because it's undefined at three, we can't conclude that the left limit equals the value of the function at that point. And that's what we would need for continuity, right? So just pointing out that this is a, not a case where the left side limit would exist. Uh, although people often think it does, um, especially if we look at the graph. Let's look at the graph for this. Okay, so this is what the graph looks like. You can see right from here that as x approaches to three, okay, we can see from here, let's zoom in a little more. Okay, so this is the graph of f of x equals to the absolute value of x minus three over x minus three. And we can see from here that as x approaches to three from the right hand side, right, the inputs are getting closer and closer to three, the outputs are always one always one, always one, always one. So from the right-hand side, it always approaches to one. And from the left-hand side, as X approaches to three from the left-hand side, the outputs are always negative one, negative one, negative one, negative one. And so by looking at this picture, 
uh, people often conclude that there that the function must be continuous at three from the right hand side or continuous at three from the left hand side. But remember that this is a little misleading because there should be little holes there, a little hole there and a little hole there because it's just not defined uh, for x equals to three. We could easily fix this by defining a new function uh, which comes in and puts in a value uh, for one of for f of three, uh, and then we would be able to have uh, continuous from one side. So, for example, if we define the new function g of x, new function g of x, which is almost the same as this one, except that this is the rule we follow whenever if x does not equal to three, we follow this rule. And then in that case, when x equals to three, we make it equal to the value we need in order to have a one-sided continuity. So for example, if we make it equal to positive one, then I know that g of x will be continuous from the right-hand side at x equal to three. So g of x in this case would be continuous from the right at x equals to three. It would still continue to be discontinuous from the left, uh, but if we wanted to fix that, we could just flip it around and make this a negative one, and then it would be continuous from the left, but not from the right. Okay, a function f is continuous on an interval if it is continuous at every number in the interval. If f is defined only on one side of an endpoint of the interval, we understand continuous at the endpoint to mean continuous from the right side or from the left. Okay, to do an example uh, involving this definition, uh, let's go back and think about circles. Okay, so the general formula for a circle is x minus h parenthesis squared plus y minus k parenthesis squared equals to r squared. This is where the h, the k, and the r are constants. And uh, we know that h comma k is the center of the circle and r is the radius of the circle. Let's look at some graphs. Okay, so here we have the formula for uh, a circle x minus h parenthesis squared plus y minus k parenthesis squared equals to r squared. And I created some sliders for those variables, um, the, the k, the r, and the h. So currently I have, oh, let's move it up. Currently I have r equal to one. So this is gonna be the radius equals to one. So here is the graph of a circle. The radius is one. And then the h and the k have been selected to be zero. That means that the center of the circle is at zero, zero. So this is your standard um, unit circle centered at zero, zero. If we change the R value to be something a little bigger, as we change the R value, say around there, here we have a circle radius uh, two, right? So the radius is two, so this is what it looks like. Uh, and of course, it could just grow bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Or smaller. And then if we want to move the, uh, the circle to a different location, then the h comma k uh, takes care of that. So the k associated with the y here moves the circle up and down depending on the value of k. And then the h over here associated with the x moves it left and right depending on the value of uh, h. So here, for example, would be a circle centered at three comma, make it negative two. There. Centered at three comma negative two with radius 1.3 or maybe radius, oops, radius 0.3 or radius three. Okay, so that's the general formula for a circle. So in particular, if we had this circle, so if we had, for example, the circle um, x minus five squared plus y equals to 
9, this would be a circle of radius 3, right? Matching this right there, r would be 3. Uh, so radius would be 3, and if it doesn't have that minus k, we can assume that it's a 0, right? So this can be rewritten as x minus 5 squared plus y minus 0 squared equals to 3 squared. Now it fits exactly that form, so the center would be 5 comma 0, and the radius is 3. Let's see the graph. So this is what the circle would look like. Okay, so uh, this is the graph of the circle. However, we notice that it isn't a function. Remember that in order for a, uh, for a graph to be the graph of a function, it must be true that every input value has exactly one output value. But in a circle, uh, almost all input values have two output values. The only exception to that would be the outer points. But other than that, everything else has two. For example, uh, if we do the vertical line test, so if we see if we do the vertical line test as we sweep through our graph, we see that at almost every point it's going to touch the two spots. It's going to touch there, and it's going to touch there. Uh, here, for example, it touches there and it touches there, right? So this is indicating that at uh, x equals to 6, there are two possible outputs, and we can't have that for a function. So the way we fix it is by uh, separating this into a, a, an equation that can graph the top part, and then separately an equation that can graph the bottom part. Right? So let's find those equations. Back to here, if we just solve for y, Okay, so if we solve for y, we get that y equals to plus or minus the square root of 9 minus x minus 5 squared. What we're going to have here is two separate functions. It's going to turn out that the plus is the top part of my circle because it's positive. And then separately, the function that has a minus out in front will be the bottom part of my circle. Right, let's graph those. Okay, so we're back to our circle. So here's a circle centered at 5 comma 0 with radius 3. And so this blue one is using this general formula over here. But now if we break it down this way and type in y equals to the square root of 9 minus x minus 5 parentheses squared, uh, we would graph just the top part, which is that orange part. And then on the other hand, if we graph uh, this one, negative 1 times the square root of 9 minus x minus 5 squared, we would just end up graphing the bottom part of the circle. So together, this equation and this equation together give me a full circle, right? But then, then uh, each one of those individually is a valid function we can work with, uh, but um, you know, we would need both of them in order to make a circle. If we don't need it to be a function, then we can just go back to the general formula up here and work with that one. OK, so let's work with uh, this one, which is the bottom part of the circle, this part right here. So I'm just going to work with an equation that has that. So now, if we just had y equals to negative 1 times the square root of 9 minus x minus 5 squared. OK, so after all that work, we saw that this is the bottom part of a circle centered at 5 comma 0 with radius 3. And we want to show that this is continuous. In fact, let's call this f of x, since it's a function now. So here we have a function. Uh, show f of x is continuous. on on 2 to 8. Now why 2 to 8? 
Well, we said this was a circle centered at 5 comma 0. Uh, so the radius is going to be 3. So it extends to the left out by 3 units, to the right by 3 units. Um, so we want to show that the function, this function is continuous on this interval inclusive of the endpoints. We're going to break this down into two pieces. First, we're going to consider the cases uh, that don't include the endpoints. So part, part one for uh, the case where x is between 2 and 8, not inclusive of the endpoints, so it's not greater than or equal to or less than or equal to, it's strictly between them, right? Or I'm just considering this not the endpoints. Okay, so let's consider that first. Let a uh, be a value inside there, be a member of 2 comma 8. That's what we show this, be an element of. Let A be an element of this set, not including the endpoints. We want to show that the limit as x approaches to A, and it's one of those numbers, of this function f of x, uh, that this equals to f of a. That's what we want to show. Okay, so this is equal to the limit as x approaches to a, unrestricted from either side, of this negative 1 times square root of 9 minus parentheses x minus 5 squared. Okay, well, we have our rules for limits. So we know that a constant can be brought out. We can separate this as the limit as x approaches to a of negative 1 times the limit as x approaches to a of the square root of 9 minus x minus 5 squared. So one of our rules for limits tells us that we can separate a product this way. Next, we know that if we have a constant, the limit as x approaches to a of just a constant is just equal to that constant. So that part can be simplified as just being negative 1. The limit as x approaches to a of the constant negative 1 is just going to be negative 1. Okay, now for this one, we have another property that says that if we have the square root of a function, the limit as x approaches to a of the square root of the function is equal to the root of the limit of the function inside. So one of our other properties of limit says that we can rewrite this as the square root of the limit of x approaches to a of 9 minus x minus 5 squared. Okay, so we can bring it inside the root uh, as long as we don't cause any problems, right? Uh, ultimately, the, uh, the value inside the root has to be positive. And, and that's because this is an even root, right? It's a square root. So we just have to keep in mind that this limit must be positive in order for this to work out. So we'll circle back to that when we're done and, and confirm that, that that seems to be true. Okay, so then we have negative 1 times. And again, we have another limit property that says that if we have a subtraction of two values like this, we can separate them. So this is going to end up being the limit as x approaches to a of 9 minus the limit as x approaches to a of x minus 5 squared. All of that inside parentheses, a uh, square root, sorry, negative 1 times. Okay, and again, we have the rule with a constant. The limit as x approaches to a of the constant 9 is just going to be 9. minus, minus, and again we have a rule that says that if we have some function raised to the power of n, in this case n equals to 2, then we can find the limit of what's inside first and then raise it to the power of n, in this case 2. So our limit properties again lets us simplify this to the limit as x approaches to a of x minus 5 and then all of that is raised to the power of 2 um, next 
uh, again, we have a property that says that if we have subtraction, we can separate them. So we have minus one times the square root of a minus parentheses, the limit as x approaches to a of x minus the limit as x approaches to a of 5, all of it being squared. And finally, we have a property that as the limit as x approaches to a of x is just going to be a, and the limit as x approaches to a of 5 is just going to be 5. Okay, and so finally what we can conclude is that this is the exact same result we would have gotten if we had just plugged in an a into our function. This is equivalent to f of a. Right? In fact, let me uh, highlight the a because my a's and my 9's look very similar. That's the a, and if we look back at our original statement, let's zoom back out. Right, we have f of x equals to negative 1 times the square root of 9 minus x minus 5. So if we just replace the x with an a, we just replace this guy right here with an a, we would get exactly this. Therefore, this is f of a. And what we have shown is that the limit as x approaches to a of f of x equals to f of a. Right? If we bring this all together, all of this is saying... All of this together is saying that the limit as x approaches to a of f of x equals f of a. Good. So by the definition of continuous, we have shown that this function is continuous for all values a between 2 and 8. So between 2 and 8, always continuous. Okay, so we've shown that f of x is continuous for all values a between 2 and a, not including the endpoints. So now all we have to do is think about the endpoints. For x equal to exactly 2, then f of 2 is equal to negative 1 times negative square root of negative So f of 2 is equal to 0. And the limit as x approaches to 2, but from the right-hand side of f of x, likely uh, in the same way that we did before, is equal to the limit as x approaches to 2 from the right-hand side of mm -hmm. negative 1 times minus 1. Okay, so for all the same or in the same uh, style as before, we can show that all of this is going to just lead to this having a limit of 0. So we've shown that the limit as x approaches to 2 from the right hand side of f of x is going to be equal to 0 which is equal to f of 2. So we've shown that uh, it's going to be continuous from the right, the function is continuous from the right hand side at 2. Likewise we can do the same thing for x equals to 8. And so in the same style as we did before, we can again go through the process of showing that the limit as x approaches to 8 from the left-hand side of this is also going to be equal to 0. And so again, we can show that the limit as x approaches to 8 from the left-hand side of f of x will be equal to 0, which is equal to f of 8 which means that we've established that this function is continuous at x equals to 8 from the left-hand side. So together, this statement and this statement and this statement brings it all together to show that the function is continuous at uh, on the interval from 2 to 8 inclusive of the endpoints. So thus, f of x equals to negative 1 times the square root of 9 minus x minus 5 squared is continuous on the closed interval from 2 to 8. This part here, so this part here convinces us that it's continuous on the uh, 
interval between two and eight, not including the endpoints. So that took care of that part. And then this takes care of um, uh, making sure that the function is continuous at two from the right hand side. F of x is continuous. x equals to 2 from the right hand side. And then this part here then allows us to conclude that f of x is continuous at x equals to 8 from the left hand side. So together they uh, allow us to conclude that the function uh, is continuous on, this, uh, on the interval between 2 and 8 inclusive of the endpoints. Okay, and then of course I omitted a little bit of work uh, when I did this. So this is similar to that style there, and how you show that this is true. Of course, looking at a graph of our function also helps us confirm that this is in fact true. So remember that here we have that this one right here, this is the graph of the function f of x equals to negative 1 times the square root of 9 minus x minus 5 squared, right? This is the bottom part of the circle centered right there at 5 comma 0 is the center, right? Radius is equal to 3. And we can see that this function is going to be continuous uh, from 2 to 8 inclusive. Inclusive of the endpoints. Okay, let's move on. Okay, theorem 4. If f and g are continuous at a and c is a constant, then the following functions are also continuous at a. So f plus g f minus g, c times f, f times g, or f divided by g, provided of course that uh, g of a does not equal to zero. Okay, so if we have, we're starting off with two functions that we know to be continuous at a point a, we can add them, subtract them, we can multiply them together, we can multiply by a constant, we can divide them, and we can be guaranteed that the outputs, the results, the resulting function, um, is also going to be continuous at a and the only consideration here the only thing we have to be careful of is to make sure we don't accidentally divide by zero okay so we can build more complicated functions from functions we already know to be continuous and if we're using these operational symbols to build our more complicated function we're guaranteed that the more complicated function is going to be continuous okay coupled with that we have theorem five. Any polynomial is continuous everywhere. That is, it is continuous on an interval R, capital R, which is from negative infinity to positive infinity. That's a really powerful statement. Any polynomial, always continuous on all values. Any rational function is also continuous where it's defined. That is, continuous on its domain. In particular, right, a rational function is a fractional function it's uh, going to be a giant fraction where there's a numerator, uh, the numerator is a polynomial, the denominator is a polynomial, and all we have to be careful about is to make sure that we're not dividing by zero. So if we avoid the case where we're dividing by zero, then the rational function is continuous everywhere, everywhere else. Okay, let's see an example using this. Okay, so uh, given this example, find the limit as x approaches to 3 of this rational function right here. Okay, so according to our theorem, uh, this is a rational function. Rational functions are continuous uh, on their domain. So this is going to be continuous for all values except for the one that makes the denominator 0. So to figure that out, let's just take that denominator over here. We put 3x minus 2, set it equal to 0, and solve for x. So we get 3x equals to positive 2, so x equals to 2 thirds. Okay, so that means that this rational function is continuous everywhere except here. That's what this means.
right? X equals to two thirds is the only one that's gonna cause a zero in the denominator. So how does this help us? Well, we were interested in this limit, the limit as X equals to three. That means that we've just shown that in uh, when X equals to three, this function is continuous at X equals to three, right? The only place it's not continuous is at two thirds. So, um, we've established that 2x to the third plus is continuous at x equals to 3. Thus, that means by definition that the limit as x approaches to 3 is just going to be equal to f of 3. So, this lets us just find this limit by just plugging it in. Okay, so just to recap, we have that the limit as x approaches to positive three of this rational function, uh, we're asked to find that. And then we realize that this is a rational function. We know from our uh, theorem five that uh, all rational functions are continuous uh, on their domain. So if we set the denominator equal to zero, we solve for x, we see that this is the only potential problem. x equals to two thirds causes a zero in the denominator. So we can conclude that that rational function is continuous for all real numbers except that x equals to two-thirds. And since we are not interested in two-thirds, we're interested in three, that then uh, establishes that this rational function is continuous at x equals to three. If it's continuous at x equals to three, it means that the limit as x approaches to three is just equal to the value of the function at three. It means that in order to find this limit, all we have to do is evaluate that rational function at three, right? So that makes it really easy to find this limit. We can just plug it in. Good, so bringing that together, our answer to the original question, what's the limit of this? This limit equals to 98 divided by seven. Okay, it turns out that most familiar functions are continuous at every number in their domain. Uh, from, a, from the appearance of the graphs of the sine and the cosine functions, we would certainly guess that this is the, that they are continuous. Uh, so uh, if we look at the quadrant one portion of the unit circle, then we know that any point on that unit circle is going to be cosine theta comma sine theta. Well, I mean, it's equal to cosine theta, sine theta anywhere on the unit circle in all quadrants, but this is just a zoomed in portion of quadrant one. And so we see that as this point approaches that point, as theta goes to zero, as the angle goes to zero, we see that cosine of theta, which is the X coordinate, right? Let's, let's add a little more detail to this. So if we, bring this back down into a triangle, then we know that this portion here is cosine of theta, right? given that the radius is one. And we know that this part here, that's the sine of theta. So as this point goes toward the point one comma zero, as theta goes down, the angle goes down towards zero, then we see that uh, the limit as theta approaches to zero of cosine of theta is approaching one. This guy is gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it approaches to one. And at the same time, the limit as theta approaches zero of sine of theta, this guy is gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller until it reaches to zero. Since cosine of theta, uh, cosine of zero equals to one and sine of zero equals to zero, the equations uh, right up here in six assert that the cosine and the sine functions are continuous at zero. The addition formulas for sine and cosine then can be used to deduce that these functions are continuous everywhere. It follows that uh, from, from part five of theorem four, that the division of two continuous functions is also gonna be continuous everywhere, except maybe where the denominator equals to zero. So then we can establish the tangent of x is also gonna be continuous, except when cosine equals to zero, continuous everywhere except when cosine equals to zero. And if we think with a graph of cosine, it equals to zero 
uh, at odd integer multiples of pi over 2. And so uh, tangent of x has infinite discontinuities at x equals to plus or minus pi over 2 plus or minus uh, 3 pi over 2 plus or minus 5 pi over 2 and so on and so forth. And so the graph of tangent of theta looks like this, right? The familiar face of tangent of theta. Good. Okay, what is this? All, all this was just showing uh, that we can use these properties uh, to confirm that tangent of theta is continuous everywhere. And we're building it on top of or we're extra, uh, we're concluding that based on the fact that tangent of theta is defined to be a division of two other functions that are known to be continuous. The division of two continuous functions results in a continuous function except where the denominator equals to zero and we can confirm that with our graph. Okay, so all of that leads us to this. The following types of functions are continuous at every number in their domain. Uh, so polynomials, rational functions, root functions, trigon trigonometric functions, inverse trigonometric functions, exponential functions, and logarithmic functions are continuous at every value in their domain. So, for example, Where is f of x equal to ln x plus tangent inverse of x divided by x squared minus 1 continuous? Question mark. Where is it continuous? Okay, so in order to do uh, answer this question, we're going to think about them piece by piece and then kind of bring it together using what we just learned that when we, um, we can use continuous functions, we can combine them uh, by adding, subtracting, multiplying uh, to build a more complicated function and know that the more complicated function is going to also be continuous on its domain. Okay, so let's think about each one, uh, one at a time. Let's find uh, or think about the ln of x. ln of x, if we graph it, it'll look like this. So here's the graph of ln of x. And so hopefully from here we can be convinced that this function is continuous everywhere except on zero, right? We can't plug in zero, ln of zero is undefined, or any negative values. So it's continuous from zero to infinity. So not including zero, continuous from zero to infinity. And then it's a cute little sketch, just to sketch a little graph. It kind of comes like this and goes like that. Okay, on the other hand, if we think about tangent inverse of x, okay, let's graph that one. Here's what tangent inverse of x looks like. And we see that um, it's continuous on all values from negative infinity to positive infinity. Right? Remember, it has a horizontal asymptote there and there at y equals to pi over 2 and at y equals to negative pi over 2. Okay, so if we think about the addition of these two functions, then they're going to, the more complicated statement of the addition of these two continuous functions is also going to be continuous uh, on their shared domain. So now the function ln x plus tangent inverse of x, right? We can think of this as this new function. We can call it g of x if you like. It's a new function, which is the addition of these two will also be continuous on, and their shared domain would then just be from zero to infinity. Okay. Now, if we look at the polynomial, uh, the denominator, the denominator is a polynomial. Now, so now we consider uh, x squared minus one, the denominator, 
this is a polynomial, and according to our theorem, this means that this is continuous everywhere in its domain, which is all real numbers. From negative infinity to positive infinity, all real numbers. Okay, so uh, according to our theorem, then a more complicated function f of x, which is made up of adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing functions that we know to be continuous is also going to be continuous on their shared domain. So, so far, the shared domain is going to be from zero to infinity, but we do have to throw in one extra little uh, caveat here. When we divide these, we got to make sure that the denominator doesn't equal zero, so we do have to solve for that. And so if we think about uh, x mi uh, squared minus one equal to zero, and we solve for x squared, we get that x squared equals one. So x equals to plus or minus root one. So x equals to plus or minus one. So at x equals to plus or minus one, we're gonna get a zero in the denominator. So we wanna avoid those values. So we bring that all together and we can conclude that, thus this new function made up of addition, subtraction, division of more complicated functions, zero comma infinity, right? Zero comma infinity because, zero to infinity uh, because that's what is the shared domain of the, the function in the numerator and the function in the denominator. Right, and we also have to throw in the except plus or minus one. Now, minus one wasn't even in that range anymore. We've already excluded it uh, since we we can't have a ln of negative one. Uh, so we also have to put in the except one. Except at x equals to one. So another way to describe this very set right here, I could just say or continuous on parentheses zero one close parentheses union one to infinity. So from zero to one union from one to infinity. And so from here we see that the only place that there's a little hole here at one, right? One is not in this set, one is not in that set. So that's where we can establish that this function is continuous. Okay, so to bring it back together, uh, if the question is, when is this ugly looking function gonna be continuous? Then one way to answer that question is to notice that this ugly looking function here is made up of several smaller, simpler to deal with functions. There's an ln function, a tangent inverse function, and a polynomial. And uh, we are told that we can add, subtract, multiply, divide uh, known continuous functions and that the output would also be continuous as long as we're dealing, um, as, as long as we're within the domain of the functions. Okay, so we can break it up into little pieces and come up with the segment that is common to all of the domains and the extra little piece of making sure that, that we are not accidentally dividing by zero. Okay, so we've established that this function is going to be continuous uh, for all values inside this set. Okay, now what if then a second part to this question, they might ask us find the limit as x approaches to um, pi over 9 of this function. At first, that might seem like a really difficult question. What? X approaches pi over 9 of this crazy thing. What do we do? All right, well, luckily, we've already done this work. We've established that this function is continuous everywhere for positive numbers except 1. And here's a positive number that's not 1. So based on this, we know that this function is continuous at x equals to pi over 9. Right? This lets me conclude that. Uh, that this function is continuous continuous at x equals to pi over 9. So in order to find this limit, all I have to do is evaluate this at pi over 9. So the limit as x approaches to pi over 9 of this ln of x plus 
tangent inverse of x divided by x squared minus 1, this is just going to be equal to evaluating it at pi over 9. Okay, so find ln of pi over 9 plus tan inverse of pi over 9 divided by pi over 9 squared minus 1. So if they want an exact answer, we're done, that's it, you can leave it like that. Or if they want a decimal approximation, then we can just go over to our calculator and calculate what this is, uh, but it shouldn't be hard after that. Okay, let's do one more example. Let's find the limit as x approaches to pi over 4 of this rational function now. Cosine x divided by 3 minus sine x. Okay, again, uh, on initial inspection, this might look like a difficult question, but it's really quite easy if we think about the fact that we know that cosine is going to be continuous for all real numbers. Because see, cosine x is continuous for negative infinity to infinity, all real numbers, and so is sine. Sine of x is continuous for negative infinity to positive infinity. Good. And um, we know that the only way that this rational function uh, could cause a problem is if we end up with a zero in the denominator. But we know that the output of the sine function is always bounded between negative 1 and 1. So since uh, neg uh, negative 1 less than or equal to sine of x less than or equal to 1, since this output value here, the biggest it could ever be is a 1, and the smallest it could ever be is a negative 1, and that's it. Every value between negative 1 and 1, it means that 3 minus whatever this output is will never be equal to 0, right? In particular, note that sine of x could never be equal to 3 for any value of x. So this could never be 0, therefore we're never going to have the problem of dividing by 0. So all of this leads me to conclude that this crazy looking function that's, that's cosine of x divided by 3 minus sine of x is going to be continuous on all real numbers. And so all that leads me to conclude thus this function cosine x divided by 3 minus sine x is continuous on negative infinity to infinity. Okay, and because it's continuous uh, for all real numbers, then that means that if I want to find the limit as x approaches to pi over 4, all I have to do is evaluate the function at pi over 4. So the limit as x approaches to pi over 4 of cosine pi over 4 over 3 minus sine of pi over 4, right? All we're doing is evaluating that rational function at that value, pi over 4, right? That's allowed as long as we know that the function is continuous. If we go back to our definition of what it means for a function to be continuous, remember that the limit as x approaches to a of f of x is equal to f of a, right? So this means that f of x is continuous at a. f of x is continuous at a if this is true. Okay, so we've established that it's continuous there, so we can just evaluate it there. Okay, so then uh, in this case, we can simplify it a little bit more without the use of a calculator to round it because this is one of our special triangles. So cosine of pi over 4 is going to be root 2 over 2 divided by 3 minus root 2 over 2. So we can simplify this, multiply numerator and denominator by a 2 right here, 2 over 2. Or we can also simp and then simplify it and get it to a point where we have a single fraction down here. So this is going to be equal to root 2 over 2 divided by 6 minus root 2 divided by 2. 
And now we multiply the numerator times the reciprocal of the denominator, and we'll end up with root 2 over 2 times 2 over 6 minus root 2. The 2's cancel, and we're left with root 2 over 6 minus root 2. And then if we want to rationalize that, we multiply the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate of the denominator. So that would be 6 plus root 2 over 6 plus root 2. And that leads us to root 2 times 6 plus root 2 divided by 6 squared minus root 2 squared. Right? This is going to be difference of squares which then leads me to uh, root 2, leads to root 2, 6 plus root 2, divided by 36, this leads to 36, and this leads to 2, which is going to be 34. 34. So we can bring that all together and say that this is our answer. The limit as x approaches to pi over 4 of cosine x over 3 minus sine x is equal to root 2, 6 plus root 2, all over 34. Okay, theorem 8. If f is continuous at b and the limit as x approaches to a of g of x equals to b, then the limit as x approaches to the composition of f composed with g of x is equal to f of b. Okay, so if we have this composition of f composed with g in this order, uh, and we're trying to find the limit as x approaches to a, uh, this theorem is indicating for us that what we can do is bring the limit inside the function, inside the argument of the f function, find the limit inside there, and then whatever that value, all we have to do is evaluate our function at that value, provided that f is continuous at b, and provided, of course, that the limit as x approaches to a of g of x does exist. Okay, let's do an example uh, that will help us explain this theorem. Okay, so let's say that we're asked to so let's say we're asked to find the limit as x approaches to one of cosine of this ugly thing, cosine of pi times one minus root x all over one minus x. Okay, um, well if we just start putting in a value in there, so note note that if we have cosine of, and then we just put a 1 in there, we get pi 1 minus root all over 1 minus, and then if we just plug in 1, we end up with 1 there and a 1 there, right? So I'll say at, at x equals to 1, uh, we end up with something we're dividing by 0. We end up with cosine cosine of 0 over 0, right? So that's not happy. All right, we need to do something else. Okay, so what that um, theorem just told us, though, is that if we have composition of functions, right? So let's consider the f of x to be equal to cosine of x. That's this outside function. And then inside of it, we have this other function. g of x is equal to the pi 1 minus square root of x all over 1 minus x. So that theorem indicated that what we could do is bring this limit inside this function, and as long as the limit of the inside function exists, and it's equal to a value that's inside the domain of the outside function, then we could just uh, end up evaluating the outside function at the value of the limit of the inside function. And we know that cosine of x is continuous for all real numbers. Okay, so what we're going to do is the following. The limit as x approaches to 1, 
cosine of pi minus root x all over 1 minus x. We're going to bring that limit on the inside. We're going to say that this is equal to cosine of, and then we'll have the limit as x approaches to 1. Right, so I'm going to bring that limit on the inside. And now I just have to figure out what this is. In order to simplify this, I already know that if I put a 1 in here, I'm going to end up with a 0 over 0 in indeterminate form. But I can do a factoring trick remembering my difference of squares. So if you recall, if we have a, a plus b, a minus b, and we FOIL it all out, we end up with a squared minus ab plus ab minus b squared. The middle terms cancel out, and so we end up with a squared minus b squared. So if we find something that's written this way, then we know we can factor it that way, right? So this helps us before if we wanted to factor something like x squared minus uh, 9, we go, oh, okay, how do we factor that? That's x squared minus 3 squared, and we know that this factors as x plus 3, x minus 3. Good. All right, well, what about here, though? We don't have that. Well, we can kind of force it a little bit in the following way. Uh, we could say that this 1 minus x squared, we can think of it as 1 squared minus the square root of x squared, right? Because the square root of x squared is just going to be x, and 1 squared is just 1. So this is a way to force this denominator to look like a difference of squares. So we know that it will factor as 1 minus root x times 1 plus root x, and that will help me with the numerator. So let me recopy the whole thing. So now that leads me to cosine of the limit of x approaches to 1 pi 1 minus root x all over 1 minus root x times 1 plus root x. And now I get to cancel out this with that, leaving me just pi in the numerator and 1 plus square root of x in the denominator. And we know that now this is a rational function. We can just evaluate it at 1. It will be continuous there. The only place this is not continuous is whenever the denominator is equal to 0, uh, which it can't be for any value because the output of a root is always going to be a positive uh, as long as we stay within the domain. And of course, it's an even root. So the inputs have to be positive greater than 1, which are fine here. We want to go toward positive 1. So this is going to be equal to cosine of pi over 1 plus root 1, right? This is a rational function, continuous on all real numbers uh, where, where, uh, inside their own domain. And so this is going to be uh, continuous for all positive real numbers. There's a note pi over 1 plus root x is a rational function and it's going to be continuous on its domain and its domain is going to be from uh, see, it's going its domain is going to be inclusive of 0 out to infinity Right? And that's because the square root has to be from 0 to infinity. 0 is allowed. Square root of 0 is 0. That's okay. Um, and for no value, there's, there isn't going to be any value that results in a 0 in the denominator because the output of the square root is always going to be positive. So uh, no other problems to consider. Its domain is from 0 to infinity. And then, of course, because 1 is in the domain, One is a member of the domain from 0 to infinity. We know we can just evaluate the function at that point, and that'll give us the result of the limit. Well, that's just going to be pi over 2. Oops. 
is equal to cosine of pi over 2, which is then equal to cosine of pi over 2 equals to 0. Okay, so find the limit as x approaches to 1 of cosine of this ugly crazy thing. So our theorem tells us that we can swap this inside. We can bring in the limit inside the argument of the function cosine. Uh, find that limit. We found that that limit equaled to pi over 2. Uh, and once we find the limit of the inside part is pi over 2, pi over 2 is part of the domain of cosine because cosine is continuous on all, uh, all real numbers. Then all we have to do is evaluate our function there. So bringing it all together, the answer to our original question is just that it equals to 0. The limit as x approaches to 1 of cosine of pi 1 minus root x all over 1 minus x equals 0. Okay, so that leads us to theorem 9. If g is continuous at a and f is continuous at g of a, then the, com the composite, um, the composition of functions f composed with g given by this notation, f composed with g at x, is equal to f composed with g of x, so that's what this notation means, and that it is also going to be continuous at a. Right, so what does this mean? So this is allowing us to conclude that if, for example, uh, we wanted to consider um, f of x equal to cosine of x squared plus 1, and we want to figure out when is this continuous? Okay, well, uh, we can see this as a composition of functions, right? There's the f, the outside function. Uh, you know what, let me uh, relabel this, because then, just to make it match that. So let's call this h. h of x is equal to cosine of x squared plus 1. Then we can consider the outside function to be f of x equals to cosine of x. And we can consider the inside function, g of x, to be equal to this x squared plus 1. And so we can see that h of x is really the composition of functions f composed with g of x, like that. It's the cosine function, f, evaluated at x squared plus 1. Cosine of x squared plus 1. Okay, so if we can think of this as the outside function and the inside function, then uh, we can figure out when this more complicated composition of functions is continuous by thinking about the fact that x squared plus 1 is continuous on all real numbers. So x squared plus 1 is continuous, um, it's going to be continuous on its domain, which is all real numbers, and its range its output is going to be from 1 to infinity. If we think about the graph of x squared plus 1, let's take a look at it. Here's the graph of x squared plus 1, right? It's a parabola uh, that's been shifted up by one unit. So its domain is all real numbers, but its output is going to be from 1 to infinity. So the outputs here are going to go from 1 to infinity, the, the output of this function. You can input whatever you want, any real number, but the outputs are only going to be from 1 to infinity. And so now if we think about cosine from 1 to infinity, it's continuous there as well. So uh, this more complicated function made up of the composition of these two functions is going to be continuous uh, for all real numbers, right? because we can start with any real number in here, and its output is going to be a value that is also uh, going to be within the domain of cosine, which means it's also going to be continuous. So we can conclude that h of x is continuous on all real numbers, negative infinity to positive infinity, right? We can start off with any real number, plug it into there, square it, plus one, it'll end up in a value that's part of the domain of cosine, and it'll be uh, continuous at that point too. So in particular, if we had some value a, let's let, let a equal to seven, just an arbitrary choice. If a is equal to seven, then we know that uh, 
g of x, the inside one, is going to be continuous at 7. g of x is continuous at 7, right? Where the g of x was the x squared plus 1. Uh, we know it's continuous at 7 because it's a polynomial. Okay. Because is a polynomial. We know that all polynomial functions are continuous on their domain, which is all real numbers, so it's definitely going to be continuous there. So we got this part. If g of x is continuous at a, and now the outside function is continuous at g of a. Well, g of a is going to be equal to g of 7 is equal to 7 squared plus 1, which is equal to 50. And we know that 50 uh, is a value in the domain of cosine. So we know that uh, cosine, cosine of 50 is going to be some value trapped between negative 1 and 1. And it's in the domain of uh, cosine. Okay, so if g is continuous at a, f is continuous at g of a, um, then the composite, composite function f composed with g uh, is going to be continuous at a. All right, the intermediate value theorem. Suppose that f is continuous on a closed interval from a to b and let n be any number between f of a and f of b where f of a does not equal to f of b then there exists a number c in uh, between a and b such that f of c equals to capital N. Okay, what is this saying? Um, so let's draw a picture that kind of matches up what this is saying. Okay, so the intermediate value theorem states that suppose that f is continuous on a closed interval from a to b. So here is our function from a to b, so this is the x function, so let's say that there is some interval from a to b. Here is a, here is b, so the function is continuous from a to b. Continuous uh, in terms of a graph, remember it means that when we draw it, we can draw it without ever having picking up our pencil. So there's no holes, there's no jumps, it doesn't shoot off to infinity, Nothing weird, just a continuous function. So here's just one such example. So let's say this guy then traces up to f of, this traces up to there, comes across to be f of a, and this traces up to there, which then traces across to be some f of b. Okay, so we have f of b there, f of a there. This is just one example and you know, a way that I could draw this. Suppose f is continuous on the interval from a to b, and let n be any number between f of a and f of b. So we're going to think about some number in between these two, uh, where we are already uh, making sure that the f of b does not equal to the f of a. When can the f of a equal f of b? That would be the special case where the function was just a horizontal line. Like if this one was f of x, then f of a, f of b, f of anything would be equal to itself, right? In this case, uh, this would be a case where f of a equaled f of b. So they're just saying ignore that. For the case of the intermediate value theorem, we're not considering this one type of function, which is continuous. We're just not considering it. Okay, but except for this case, except for this case, in all other, other cases where you have a continuous function, they won't equal each other, then there will definitely be a gap here. f of b will not be equal to f of a, so there will definitely be a value n somewhere in here. It doesn't matter where, it doesn't have to be right in the middle. It could be, say, maybe around there, say around there this could be my capital N right there, somewhere between f of b and f of a. So let's go across and see where that goes. Here's my N. 
let n be any number between f of a and f of b, where, of course, f of a does not equal to f of b, then there must exist at least one value c in between a and b, not inclusive of the endpoints, such that f of c equals to n. So based on my picture, see if we go across and draw this line across, we can kind of reverse engineer this and find the value c. There's c. Okay. That's what this is saying. There must be at least one value c such that f of c equals to n. Now here, note that the way I drew this, f of c equals to capital N. There must be at least one. And that's true for any value n, so it doesn't have to be that one. And there could be more than one depending on how the picture is drawn. Let's do a different one. So one possible way that my function could be drawn is this way. So here f of x is continuous between a and b and f of a maps to somewhere around there. So that leads to f of a. In this case f of b maps to somewhere over here. So that will lead me back to over there. That would be f of b. Notice that f of a is not equal to f of b. We don't have that special horizontal case. Okay, so now um, the initial conditions have been met. Suppose that f is continuous on a closed interval from a to b and let n be any number between f of a and f of b where f of a does not equal to f of b. Okay, so we can choose any value n. Say I choose this value here, n, between a and b then there exists a number c between a and b such that f of c equals to n and there could be more than one so again if we draw this out we can see that in fact there's one there there's one there and there's one there so the way i drew this one i have one value there c sub one and another value there c sub two and another value here c sub three all of them satisfy the condition that f of c1 equals to capital N, f of c2 also equals to capital N, and also f of c3 equals to capital N. So this theorem says that there must be at least one, there could be many more, as you see here, there could be an infinite number of them, uh, but you cannot have zero of them. It's not possible for you to draw a graph that satisfies these conditions and somehow this isn't true, right? Let's try and draw one that where that would be true. What would the graph look like? So let's draw, draw a, a graph. Let's try and draw a graph where this is true. So let's say it's continuous from A to B. And let's say, of course, it's going to hit that spot right there. And it's continuous, so I can go over here. And somehow I got to make it to the spot over here. Right? I know this is there, I know this is there. I gotta try and make it over there. If I'm trying to make it over there and I'm continuous, I'm gonna have to cross this line at some point. I can't skip it uh, because if I skip it, if I skip it and if I just go from there and then all of a sudden I'm down here and I do that, well then this is no longer continuous. Or if I just do like a little circle and then do that and then maybe that, I'm no longer continuous, right? So in order to guarantee that the function f is continuous, it must be true that there is a, uh, every single value between a and b is experienced at least once for, uh, with our function. So it's got to cross uh, the value capital N at least once. Right, that's the other interpretation. Uh, f of x is continuous, therefore every possible output between f of a and f of b, every value along this line, every single one of these values must be experienced at least once because the function is continuous. Okay. Show this equation has at least one solution between one and two. So let's say you're given uh, 4x cubed minus 6x squared 
equals to 2 minus 3x. And you want to show that there is at least one answer somewhere between uh, 1 and 2. 1 point something. There's at least one answer somewhere in there. Okay, so one thing we could do is to move everything to one side. Uh, so I'm going to end up with 4x cubed minus 6x squared plus 3x minus 2 equals to 0. So if I can show that this is true, um, then I would have shown that this is true, right? So this is between 4x, this is 4x between uh, 1 and 2. So at least one solution somewhere in that interval, and same for this one, 4 less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 2. Somewhere between 1 and 2 that there is at least one answer. Remember, we're not necessarily looking for the answer. We're just trying to establish that there's definitely an answer. Okay, so note that now this is a polynomial. Note, 4x cubed minus 6x squared plus 3x minus 2 is a polynomial. And polynomials are continuous on their domain, which is all real numbers. And so, continuous... It's continuous from negative infinity to infinity, or in particular, it's going to be continuous between uh, 1 and 2. Okay, so now if we evaluate this at x equals to 1, we get 4 blank cubed minus 6 blank squared plus 3 times blank minus 2. So we can evaluate this at x equals to 1. Put a 1 there, put a 1 there, put a 1 there. And so that just leaves us with 4 minus 6 plus 3 minus 2, which then gives us 7 minus 6, which is 1, minus 2 gives us minus 1, or a negative. Right, we've established that uh, when we evaluate this function at x equals to 1, we get a negative. What about when we evaluated x equals to 2? At x equals to 2, we get 4 blank cubed minus 6 times blank squared plus 3 times blank minus 2. And if we plug in a 2 into there, 2 there, 2 there, 2 there, we get... 4 times 8 minus 6 times 4 plus 6 minus 2, which is going to be 32 minus 24 plus 6 minus 2, which is going to be equal to 12, which is going to be equal to 8 plus 6 minus 2, or 14, 12, 12, a positive. So uh, if we think of this as our function f of x, just to put it in the function notation, so if we put it into f of x notation, f of x is equal to 4x cubed minus 6x squared plus 3x minus 2. This is a polynomial function. We know it's continuous on all real numbers. And in particular, we found that f of negative, oops, f of positive 1, f of positive 1 equals to negative 1, and we found that f of positive 2 equals to positive 12. So uh, here's what we have so far. Let me attempt to begin to draw the graph. Okay, so now let's think of the graph of the function f of x. We've established that it's continuous everywhere. That means that when I draw the graph, it's going to be something that can be drawn like this. I can draw it without ever lifting my pencil, right? This is one example of what f of x would look like. I don't know if it looks like that, but I know that there are no holes. It doesn't jump anywhere. It can be drawn without ever lifting my pencil. That's what it means for it to be continuous. 
Okay, I also know that there are definitely two points on this function. I've established that this is one of those points, and this is another one of those points. So when I draw the graph, I don't know what it looks like, but I know that it's going to have to make its way from there and somehow make its way up to there. I don't know exactly if it looks like this, or maybe it shoots up and does this kind of thing. I don't know. Maybe it'll just kind of become kind of a smooth thing like that or maybe it just goes kind of a more direct way. I don't know. I don't know what the graph of the function f of x looks like necessarily, but it doesn't matter. No matter how you draw it, because it's continuous, it must be true, thanks to the intermediate value theorem, that every single output from negative one to positive 12 must be experienced at least once. There's no way to go from negative one as an output to positive 12 as an output and somehow skip some value in between there, right? We can't draw this graph and end up jumping it or having a hole or doing something weird like shooting off to infinity or anything like that. And in particular, a very popular one is to think about n equals to, is to think about the case where n equals to zero. So in other words, no matter how I draw this function of f of x, there's no way to draw it without crossing through the x-axis, right? Either, either I cross through it, or there would be like a little hole, or there would be some sort of a weird jump, but none of those things are allowed when we're thinking about continuous functions. So, by the, without even having to draw it, just because I've established that the function has a value here, I know that f of x, has a point, has a point at one comma negative one, and I know that f of x has a point at two comma twelve, and I know f of x is continuous on 1 to 2. So by the intermediate value theorem, I can conclude there must be at least one place, at least one place where my function is going to cross the x-axis. So by the intermediate value theorem, IVT, by the intermediate value theorem, we know there must be at least one value called C, value C, member of 1 through 2, such that f of C equals to 0. Okay, so that means that there must be at least one answer to this one by the intermediate value theorem. Therefore, we can go back to our original statement and conclude that there must be at least one answer to this equation. Okay, so that's a very popular use of the interme intermediate value theorem. You're very often given something like this. All we have to do is push it over to one side, set it, set it equal to zero. And uh, remember, our goal at this point is not to find the answer. It's just to establish that there is an answer, that there's going to be at least one solution in the real numbers. This is a polynomial. We know it's continuous on all real numbers. Um, and so if we can find a place where the function output is positive and then another place where the function output is negative, then we know that there must be at least one place between them when the output is going to be equal to exactly zero. So we're going to use that a lot in the next couple of chapters. All right, I think that should be more than enough to uh, get started on your homework. Uh, so please let me know if you have any problems, issues, concerns. Stay in touch.